The mighty St. Lawrence. Weaving between its shores, the river inspires an entire people. At times, gulf. At times, estuary. It reaches deep into Quebec, a never-ending wave that tastes of the sea. The schooner Sedna IV has returned to Canada. Over the past three years, she has crisscrossed the planet to document nature's beauty and fragility. But she made some troubling observations along the way. Almost everywhere, on land and in the oceans, species are struggling to survive, victims of our uncontrolled exploitation of natural resources. Today, as her latest mission draws to a close, Sedna IV returns to her source, sailing up the Gulf of St. Lawrence to better understand and appreciate its bounty and fragility. The Way That Walks, as indigenous peoples called it, is fed by lakes and rivers representing nearly one quarter of the Earth's fresh water. The river also tells the story of those who live on its shores and islands, who sail and fish its waters, people who are said to have salt water in their veins. It is the soul of a proud nation, one whose history and destiny have been shaped by their maritime heritage. Its bounty attracts life in every imaginable form. Its complex and varied ecosystems and its abundant resources support a variety of wildlife. People come from around the world to marvel at its landscapes and diversity. Seals, dolphins, and whales come here to feed following age-old migration cycles that their survival depends on. Every year, the largest mammals on the planet return to partake of this extraordinary productivity. Thirteen whale species frequent the St. Lawrence, making it one of the best places on Earth to observe our last giants. Among the largest animals on Earth, the fin whale can reach over 20 meters in length and weigh from 40 to 80 tons. Nicknamed the Greyhound of the Sea, its top speed is almost 40 kilometers per hour. Hunted in the North Atlantic until 1972, fin whales are still classified as endangered in many regions. No one knows exactly where fin whales go when they leave the St. Lawrence in late fall. In fact, discovering the migration routes of most whale species is one of the greatest challenges facing the scientists who study them. But the breeding grounds of one species is known, the humpback whale. After wintering in the waters off the Dominican Republic, humpback whales return to the St. Lawrence in great numbers. They return each year to feed on krill and small fish, consuming up to 1,500 kilograms of food per day. After the International Whaling Moratorium in 1986, humpback whale populations have grown considerably. Humpbacks can grow up to 15 meters long and weigh over 45 tons. After breathing at the surface for a time, they dive and raise their wide tail flukes, which allows them to be identified. Much like human fingerprints, Individual whales have distinct tail pigmentations. 
Humpbacks are a favorite of tour operators. And they frequently delight whale watchers with their spectacular displays. But of all the great whales, the blue whale is the most impressive. Up to 150 tons of power and grace. The largest mammal of all time, it averages over 25 meters long. The largest specimen ever captured in the Antarctic measured over 33 meters. It is estimated that the relentless whaling of the last century reduced its numbers by 99%. Even after the international ban, it has struggled to recover. Today, it is likely that only a few thousand remain, and the blue whale remains on the endangered species list. While the St. Lawrence is one of the best places in the world to observe blue whales, the local population numbers only a few hundred, and no one yet knows where they go when they leave in the fall. The Sedna Force crew wanted to follow the great whales of the St. Lawrence to better document their movements. In partnership with a team of Richard Sears, a pioneer in marine mammal research, the schooner will crisscross the Gulf of St. Lawrence in search of blue whales. Discovering the migration routes of this species is a lifelong dream for Sears who has sought to solve this mystery for over 30 years. Sears and Sedna Four's mission chief, Jean Lemire, have been studying whale behavior together for years. Today, the crew embarks on one of the most significant oceanographic expeditions ever undertaken to discover the migration routes of blue whales. What we want to do with Sedna is survey the Laurentian Channel with zigzag transects as far as Cabot Strait, or even further, in the hopes of seeing blue whales all through the area. The plan is to tag the blue whales from mid-September until as late in the year as we can manage to try to see where they go, or at least see what route they take out of the St. Lawrence. We hope the tags will last long enough to give us an idea where and how far they go along the coast of North America, or even further. We know the blue whales are very active. We know some animals who may be off Nova Scotia in an area called the Gully could be in the estuary 19 days later, as we've seen in the past. But we don't have much information on that. It's amazing that after 30 years of research, we still don't know the migration routes once they leave the St. Lawrence. We mostly know what goes on along the coast. We know a lot about what happens in the area from Gaspé to Mingan and up towards Tadoussac. We have a very good idea about many of the animals' movement patterns. Fin whales, humpbacks, blue whales, and so on. But we don't know where they go once they leave the St. Lawrence. This huge study hopes to cover the entire St. Lawrence in partnership with scientists from Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Unfortunately, blue whales have been scarce this year. Bad news for the scientists, who have unleashed an army of researchers to solve the mystery of the whale's migration. We know that right now, at least eight blue whales are in the area. They've been spotted from the air and observed from boats by the government. So there are fewer blue whales than there were back in the 1990s, even in the estuary. And for a whale, there's no real other way in. Well, there are other routes, but we know this is a good spot. The tracking data indicates that they come this way. Some have gone south of the Magdalen Islands, but most come through here. Veronique Lesage is a Fisheries and Oceans Canada scientist. She coordinates the satellite monitoring program for the blue whales in the St. Lawrence. 
Blue whales have been classified as endangered in Canada since 2005, and the Canadian government has a legal obligation to protect them. The purpose of the project is to learn what blue whales do out beyond the estuary and the Gulf of St. Lawrence and outside the summer season for which we have the best data. We know a lot about the areas where they feed, but we don't yet know where the animals spend the winter. That's when they give birth and they raise their calves. It's a very important time in their life cycle. People ask us where that happens, and for now, we have to say maybe in the south, but we can't say for sure. New satellite tracking technology can help answer these questions. The tag is the beige part you see here. The little antenna transmits a signal to the satellites. This part is sterile, and these are the anchors. Unlike the older models, which we never wanted to use, these tags are designed to attach to the dorsal fin, which, like our ears, is just cartilage. If we miss the dorsal fin and hit too low, the darts are too short to reach the underlying muscle, so that limits the risk of infection. All that happens is that it anchors to the fatty tissue just under the skin. The problem is that when we miss the target, we can't track the animal as long as we would otherwise, because if the device isn't anchored in the stiff cartilage, it can stick out from the body. The satellite transmitters send the data directly to satellites overhead, so we can track the animals wherever they go on the planet. It's fantastic. Lesage and her team focus their efforts on the St. Lawrence estuary, while Sears' team covers the Gulf. From the tip of the Gaspé Peninsula, to Cabot Strait, the presumed entry and exit corridor of the Blue Whales. The schooner reaches the French archipelago of saint pierre et miquelon located 25 kilometers off Newfoundland. Large numbers of whales regularly frequent the area, known for being highly productive. Blue whales are often solitary, but in an area with abundant food, you might see every mile or two, a dozen or even 20 whales in one area. In bodies of water like here in the St. Lawrence, food isn't set out in a circle or a square. There are streams of fish or krill in the water that follow streams of chlorophyll, phytoplankton, and so on. So the animals follow that which are themselves affected by currents, waves, and water temperatures. And that all fluctuates over the course of a year, over a season, and of course, from year to year. But there are places where you can reliably expect to see blue whales, like the St. Lawrence estuary, around the Minganenticosti area, or the tip of the Gaspé Peninsula. So, we can cover a lot of nautical miles in a day just to find where the animals are hanging out. or 20 different humpback whales in the area here, which is exciting. This concentration of humpbacks means that there is food here. A few minke and fin whales have also been observed, but there's still no sign of any blue whales. What's this guy doing here? <laughs> Scientists use photographs of the undersides of the tail to identify humpback whales. Each one has a distinctive pattern, allowing individuals to be told apart. The humpback has recovered because scientists have been able to preserve its vital habitat. To properly protect a species, we must first understand its migratory routes and the areas it travels through. In the waters off the Dominican Republic, 
Sears and Lemire share the underwater world of the humpback, a true privilege for those who study them. In the clear waters off Silver Bank, a shoal protected by the Dominican Republic, scientists observe a female and her calf. Occasionally, mutual curiosity between two species can produce magical encounters that demonstrate the special relationship between whales and humans. The female slowly steers her calf toward the divers. The calf is only a few months old and still learning. The female watches over the encounter. While scientists are very familiar with this winter breeding area, they would like to better understand the routes humpbacks use when they migrate north to their feeding grounds. Small satellite tags affixed to the whale's backs using modified air guns allow scientists to follow the humpback's daily movements. One especially effective tag sent positioning data for 57 days as the whale migrated north. This precious data helped reveal the whale's precise route from the Dominican Republic to the waters off the coast of Newfoundland. These results are part of a sustained effort by scientists to better protect the species. With the blue whale in the North Atlantic, it's not clear if we're dealing with one population or several. This population, like so many others, has been extensively hunted. We didn't think we'd find many individuals. Even today, we have no idea how many animals there are in this population, but we're talking about a few hundred. Over the years, very few calves have been observed in the St. Lawrence. We don't know why. We thought at one point that it was a problem of reproduction. However, data from other places suggest that the animals may be weaned earlier in the year than when we can begin our systematic observation here in the estuary or the northwestern part of the Gulf. The weanlings may also decide to go elsewhere or stay further to the south for some reason. So we don't have the answer yet. There are projects on the way to throw light on the question of blue whale reproduction, but we'll have to wait a few years to get the final answer. Despite weeks of searching, the scientists must admit defeat this year. We've been on the lookout for blue whales for a while. Yes, it's odd that we haven't seen a blue whale in the St. Lawrence. Surprising. It's possible that the season's been delayed because of the winter. And then, the very hot summer. Hard to say. The St. Lawrence is changing. These changes are occurring because of various and complex factors, including climate change which alters currents and modifies how food is distributed. Understanding and predicting the consequences of these variations is a huge challenge for the scientists who expend considerable effort each year to protect the species that depend on it. In winter, the ice takes longer and longer to form, which can affect certain migration habits. Most whales must leave the St. Lawrence before the ice forms but where do they go? Increasingly, researchers are taking an interest in huge underwater mountains called seamounts. The team sets course for the Azores. This Portuguese volcanic archipelago located on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge was once an underwater mountain range.
These islands in the middle of the Atlantic are a natural refuge for marine mammals. 27 species of cetacean, some resident, some migratory, frequent this area. Among them is the sperm whale, the largest of the toothed whales. Males can reach over 20 meters in length and weigh nearly 60 tons. Humpback whales occasionally visit the Azores. This female and her calf are probably traveling from the Cape Verde Islands off the African coast to their feeding grounds off the coast of Iceland and Norway. The research team will try to deploy satellite tags on blue whales to better understand their migration patterns in this sector of the Atlantic. The blue whales have arrived. Their powerful spouts can rise up to six meters and are visible from a great distance, making it easier for the scientists to spot them. Right there. The tags being 3,500 bucks uh, makes it a little bit stressful when you're going to shoot. That's why you want to have the best conditions possible. And uh, these conditions may be considered the best conditions possible here in the Azores. The animal's pretty relaxed, it's nearby. So I think we have a good chance of being able to uh, approach it and trying to put the tag on. The distance you need to be at is about four to five meters, no further than that, to, to make the shot. And actually, this is good, this situation, because we're, the animal's gonna be used to our constant movement and the steadiness of what we're doing, so perhaps it'll be more accepting of us when we get closer. And this animal's, so far, as just looking at its behavior at the surface, it's nice because it seems to lift up that area that we need to shoot at, so just, around the dorsal fin or just below. Some tags only last for 10 days, two weeks. You never know, but what we'd like to get is at least a month. You know, we'll hope to have that and hope that the animal swims, uh, you know, on its migration north and we learn something about how they use the oceans. You know, it may not actually get to Ireland or, or Iceland or close to it, but we'll see if it use, goes along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge or if it stops off on some seamounts. Uh, to one side or the other of the Mid-Atlantic mid Ridge, and that's something that I find more and more interesting is that you know, it shows that these animals aren't just using coastal areas where we perceive it to be the most productive, and it, it is, those are productive areas, but we're finding out that there are other spots that these animals know about that we don't, and it's all these seamounts out in the ocean uh, which are a little less accessible to, to humans, and probably that's a good thing. <laughs> okay, let's go in there. When she comes up, when she commits to breathing, go in. But we're going to have to be a lot tighter. This is far away. Ooh. Of course, it's going upwind. God damn it. Okay, she's kicking, go, go. So close. At that moment, that's when gentleness goes out. We get in there, bang, finish. It was tempting, but it was a little far, and it was a little forward. And like us. He's wondering what we're doing.
know. There was no way I was going to get that. No. So the game's almost up here. Ah! It's cutting underneath us. Too far, too far. Ah, oh, shit. We lost it. Quick, get the tag. Get the tag, the tag. I think we lost it. It's hit too low. Good, good. <sighs> that's the, that's important. OK, OK. That's the. Well, that was a bad shot. But anyway, I think I was getting fed up. <laughs> <laughs> That was close. Well, the other one was, yeah, it was, it hit, but it didn't do what it was supposed to, what we'd hoped for. Yeah, we, it shot a little, I shot a little low and um, hit the water. And uh, so that keeps it from penetrating pro properly. And anyway, we learned some stuff. Yeah. Well, the good thing is you still have a tag. The yeah. tag is not lost. It can be used another day. Or in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Or in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, yep. <laughs> Like their kin in the St. Lawrence, the Northeast Atlantic blue whales have once again foiled the scientists. The migration routes of the largest mammal on the planet remain a mystery. Spring has finally arrived. The ice is breaking up, freeing the Gulf of St. Lawrence from the hold of winter. The first blue whales arrive at the entrance to the Gulf, feeding on the spring plankton bloom. Blue whales can become trapped by moving ice flows, so ice represents a real threat. Reckless or inexperienced whales may even drown, unable to reach the surface to breathe. Unlike last year, the blue whales have arrived, and in such numbers that the scientists can pick and choose their targets. But it is vital to photo-identify the whales before installing the satellite tags. And with over 40 blue whales in this sector, care and patience are required. I need photos because we didn't see that animal yesterday. been identified among the group. Pairs are often easier to approach, and seers will focus on these animals. OK, just stop here, wait. We'll wait one more time. If this guy's too difficult, we'll head that way. that one. She's not showing the dorsal. OK, you're a little close. Get me in there. Get me in there, Case. No, not yet. Whoops. Next time. OK, go. It's right in beautifully. Nice job, baby. Yes, nice job. Yes. First All one. Right. That was pretty good. It's high up. Yeah. Took my time. I was even aiming a bit with the thing for a change. <laughs> a tag has finally been deployed. 
the scientists can now follow the whale's movements. The information we get from these particular tags is the animal's location, nothing more. Other types of tags can transmit information about diving behavior, but there's a trade-off. They're larger and they tend not to last as long. For us to track blue whales all winter long, we need to make sure the tags stay on and keep working as long as possible. So for the moment, we're not collecting data on diving behavior. The tag transmits to the satellite every time the animal comes up to the surface, so we want it to be as high as possible on the animal's back. That's the dorsal fin. So every time the tag comes out of the water, it sends a signal. There may or may not be a satellite passing overhead at that moment, so we don't get a signal every time the animal surfaces. A satellite may take around 12 minutes to pass over this area, so the animal has to surface during those 12 minutes. A blue whale can stay underwater up to 20 minutes, so there's no guarantee that whenever a satellite passes, we'll get a signal. So far, we've tagged 25 blue whales since 2010. And 24 out of the 25 tags worked for a period of time. Its name is Symphony. It's one of the first blue whales that Richard Sears' photo identified in the St. Lawrence over 30 years ago. Symphony sent data for six months. Wow. Symphony, who traveled here. This shows Symphony's movements. There's a different color for each month. We tagged this animal in the estuary in November. She set off on her migration in November, going right out of the Gulf and making for this area, where the water is four to 5,000 meters deep, an area just north of an underwater mountain chain called a seamount. And you can see from the track, in fact, there are two periods. There's November, then in dark blue, there's December. Then she heads towards Nova Scotia, and we lose the signal. We thought that was the end of it. But we were pleased we'd collected a fair amount of data. But no, she shows up again two weeks later in this area off the coast of Delaware, then goes back up to Nova Scotia. Then what's interesting is that in March, here in red, she decides to head back to the Gulf, but that year there was a lot of ice. So instead, she decides to backtrack and wait till later to enter the Gulf. And she spends the rest of the winter and the spring up to May, when we lost the signal, back in the area to the north of the seamount. That's interesting, because we know that when she came north to enter the St. Lawrence, there was a lot of ice and she didn't enter. But she went back to the exact same place she went when she left the St. Lawrence. Yes. So if that's a productive zone, we know that in the spring they're looking for food. Right. So, before we get an in-depth understanding of what's going on with the species, this population over the winter, outside the feeding period, we have more work to do. We'll keep on tagging. It's hard work, slowly but surely. Better understand to better protect. It took over 30 years of effort, research, and passion to write the first chapters of the Charter to protect and conserve the largest animal to ever have lived. Obviously, with only one or two tags, even if they were females, it's exciting, of course, 
but it doesn't allow us to draw any conclusions about what this population does in general. If we want to conserve a species like the blue whale, we have to expand our efforts well beyond a small area, because the animals travel such great distances. So, for example, with the data we now have, we know that not only should we align our efforts with the U.S., but also start to look at international waters to try to better understand the species and its needs. When it comes to conserving natural ecosystems and biodiversity, the stakes are enormous and planet-wide. Never in Earth's history has the rate of species extinction been so high. Our insatiable consumption of the world's natural resources has weakened the equilibrium among species and threatens life in all its forms. The St. Lawrence is no exception. The fragility of these unique and complex ecosystems calls for great prudence. For centuries, we hunted whales in order to light our homes. Over time, whale oil was replaced by other sources of non-renewable fossil fuels. Yet even knowing the toll inflicted by past practices, humans cannot seem to learn from the errors of their ways. The quest for and control of oil have generated conflict all over the world and pumped greenhouse gases into the atmosphere with devastating effects on the climate. On Anticosti Island, a natural gem of the St. Lawrence, we are fracturing the ground in search of fossil fuels. And the vast St. Lawrence Valley is also in the sights of those who search for oil and gas. In the middle of the St. Lawrence, on the site of Old Harry, large oil reserves are thought to exist deep under the Great River. But scientists have warned governments about the devastating consequences of an oil spill. This is the Wells Pantry, and if anything were to happen with exploration, we know this is one of the first places that would be affected. Yes, all the simulations done by the folks at Memorial University and others have shown that if there's an oil spill near Old Harry, it'll wash up on the coast of Newfoundland, but eventually spread much further. It'll affect the Magdalen Islands and other fishing grounds in the St. Lawrence, but quite possibly, much further out. But this whole area is the pantry. With all the different things we're doing, pollution, inadequate water treatment, the prospect of oil drilling, we know that the belugas have their own problems and that eventually other marine mammals in the St. Lawrence will also be affected. Money talks, and big business reigns supreme. The environment isn't given a passing thought. We know that without environmental balance, that species, including our own, will struggle to survive. The risks are very real, and scientists' fears are only heightened by the specter of past catastrophes. A single liter of oil can contaminate one million liters of water. ever-expanding search for fossil fuels is among the greatest threats to the survival of many species, including our own. The exploitation of marine oil resources, the oil sands, and the many oil and gas pipelines have inevitable environmental consequences. The Earth is being smothered with a new heat wave, and the excessive emissions of greenhouse gases will continue to change the climate with devastating consequences that are already being felt around the world. Locally, increased shipping traffic to transport oil 
will affect the fragile habitats of whales. The St. Lawrence beluga, a resident species threatened with extinction, is struggling to survive in an environment that is increasingly disturbed by human activity. Measures to protect the species, adopted in collaboration with the shipping industry, must be put in place quickly if we are to save the St. Lawrence beluga. But time is of the essence. Only 900 are thought to remain, and scientists have observed a decline in their numbers in recent years. Sedna Four has returned from a trip around the world, one that demonstrated to her crew the urgency of taking action. Faced with the unchecked exploitation of resources, species everywhere are struggling to survive. For Mission Chief Jean Lemire, a wind of change is needed, and quickly. It's funny to think that this is where it all began. It was over 30 years ago. And I came to this beach to study birds, puffins. I was here taking notes and a guy came along. It, it was Richard Sears. He offered to take me out to sea. We came across a blue well, just past Lilo Perroquet. And it changed my life. It's funny because since then we've done so many things. We've been around the world, we've traveled. We've tried to make the public aware and... I think the more we traveled in the world, the more we realized how much work there is to do. And the only hope is children, young people. That's why we do so much work with young people. We try to instill the right values from the beginning, because maybe one day they'll be in charge and they'll change things. But we don't seem to be getting anywhere. It's as if there have been wonderful times, times when we really felt that people were listening, that they got it and believed in it. But I don't know. Perhaps, to heal this ever-widening rift between humans and nature, we need to stop and simply take in the world's beauty. The whale's spout rises like a beacon. The perseverance of scientists should be an inspiration and serve as a model of how to exploit the Earth's resources. Can we reconcile ecological and economic priorities in order to preserve nature in all her beauty and fragility? We must, because in this confrontation between humans and nature, there are likely to be neither winners nor losers. If we do not quickly change our attitudes towards conservation, there will only be victims.